Bonjour. Comment tu t'appelles? Let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at osteomyelitis and the surgery. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Here's a warm-up question, which is a true or false. Acute osteomyelitis, A, there is often history of bone trauma. B, long bone, long tubular bones are common sites. C, bone drilling is preferred to saucerization. D, saucerization is preferable to bone drilling. That's with acute osteomyelitis. You may pause the video, write down your answers. I'll give you the answers at the end of the lecture. So what exactly is osteomyelitis? It's infection of the bone. Remember, anything that ends in itis is inflammation. So there is some sort of inflammation of the bone, an infection and inflammation of the bone. It's divided predominantly into two main types. You have your acute osteomyelitis, so anything that is below two weeks. Anything that is above two weeks is referred to as chronic osteomyelitis, but typically it's going to be greater than six weeks or more of the infection. Between this two weeks to about six weeks, most patients may have even a subacute presentation. What are some of the risk factors? So the portal to pathogen entry, if there's any trauma, for example, an open fracture or orthopedic surgeries, surgical prosthesis, intravenous drug use, certain diseases like TB, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, immunosuppression, alcoholism, and sickle cell disease. What's the pathophysiology? So remember that the root of infection could be as a result of a hematogenous spread, very common in children, or patients with urinary catheters or TB. Rarely it's from direct or contiguous spread from trauma or a cellulitis or an abscess or a surgery or even a prosthesis. Most of the organisms that cause acute hematogenous osteomyelitis are going to be Staphylococcus auris, but you may have other less common pathogens like Streptococcus pyogenes, Haemophilus influenza in children, gram-negative bacilli in adults, Pseudomonas aeruginosa in IV drug users, and Salmonella in sickle cell patients. Remember that whatever the case may be, the bacteria is going to be lodging in your end arteries of the metaphysis and they begin to multiply. Now, this is the most common site so you have the metaphysio end of a single long bone especially around the knee this is the most common site of acute osteomyelitis so once this is happening there's going to be an influx an increase in serum and white blood cells in that area that leads to decreased blood flow and pressure necrosis that's also going to be happening and remember that these red blood cells that are coming to this focus of infection are pretty much going to be releasing certain enzymes that are going to be digesting the bone resulting in bone lysis and leaving behind this necrotic areas which we call as a bone sequestra or sequestrum and surrounding all this some new bone is also going to be laid down which is what we refer to as involucrum pus can actually move in the Harvesian canal and the medullary canals and eventually it's going to be beneath the periosteum and remember that chronic osteomyelitis will ensure after six weeks it should have been six weeks of infection now what's the clinical features generally there will be a history of trauma maybe a skin or a throat infection may be there and or even a history of an infection, you may have local inflammation and significant pain in the affected area. You may have systemic symptoms like anorexia, fever, irritability, nausea, malaise, and a rapid pulse. There may be limitation to the joint movements and even a slight joint effusion in the neighboring joints, tenderness, swelling of the soft tissue, and guarding, or apparently on the physical examination. The diabetic patients may actually be asymptomatic due to neuropathy. You may have vertebral osteomyelitis where there is a localized spinal infection. In TB, you may get a cold abscess or a, a cold presentation. Then you may have chronic back pain, which is worse at night and at rest. And you may also have associated this discitis. I don't know if I butchered that or I pronounced that correctly. 
how do you make a diagnosis? So pretty much a full blood count, which is going to be showing an increase in the white blood cell count, plus or minus an anemia. ESR and C-reactive protein are going to be increased because there's inflammation that's going on. Blood culture is the gold standard. You may also do culture of the bone aspirate. You may do culture of pus if there's a discharging sinus, but this is much more common with the chronic type of osteomyelitis. You may also get local joint effusions. You should perform a urine analysis, microscopy culture and sensitivity to look for causes. Then of course, when you do an X-ray, you're going to be seeing a dark area in the bone, a soft tissue swelling. However, there may be minimal signs in the acute infection. MRI actually is going to give you a much better picture than an x-ray. But of course, then you may get this periosteal elevation and soft tissue swelling that may be just one of the early features. So they're going to be having this deep circumferential soft tissue swelling with obliteration of the muscular planes. What's our differential diagnosis? It could be septic arthritis. So you may have swelling and tenderness directly on the joints with intense pain on joint movements. And of course, a high white blood cell count and positive cultures. It could be rheumatic fever, this more insidious onset, less localized with constitutional symptoms. You may have an Erwing's sarcoma, which is a malignant bone tumor. Here, early symptoms are actually more insidious and less intense, and they present with bone destruction. What's the management of acute osteomyelitis? So the infection must be diagnosed early. Intravenous antibiotics, so usually oxacillin or cloxacillin, 8 to 16 grams in adults. We start this soon after obtaining specific uh, specimen cultures. And then, of course, the antibiotics are given six weeks initially as IV. Then we transition them to oral. Monitor their temperature, the swelling, the pain, the white blood cell count, and the joint mobility. Then, surgically, we may actually open drainage of the abscess if the antibiotics fail or if there are signs of an abscess forming. Then after surgical drainage, we leave the wound open to heal by secondary intention. Now, what about chronic osteomyelitis? So here, it's very, very common in the low extremities of a diabetic patient. So what's the pathophysiology? So usually it's as an end result of either untreated or poorly treated acute osteomyelitis. So occasionally it can occur due to trauma or surgery. And most of the times it's not caused by one organism, but more or less a polymicrobial etiology. So if you have this untreated acute osteomyelitis, remember that the cavity is going to be walled off by an involucrum, which is, of course, new bone, which contains granulation tissue. It contains sequestrum. And it also contains bacterium. Sequestrum is the dead bone. Then you may have draining pus in the surrounding soft tissue and the skin. Sometimes they may form sinus tracts and there may be persistent drainage that can actually even lead to carcinomas in that area. Then the bone fragments and the exudates are usually unreachable by the antibiotics, so it results in severely deformed bones and pathological fractures in patients with chronic osteomyelitis. The persistent drainage following an episode of an acute osteomyelitis or onset of inflammation in cellulitis following an open fracture may be seen. Fever, pain, mild systemic symptoms and tenderness may be present. It's quite easy to diagnose when drainage is actually present and the x-ray is showing that there is some bone destruction and some deformity. And in cases with abscess drainage, radionucleotide or radionuclide rather imaging studies are very, very helpful. And when you do your x-rays, you may get an area of radiolucency with an irregular sclerotic bone. You may get irregular areas of destruction present, and there may be some periosteal thickening that can be seen. So this is an example of an osteolytic type of lesion, as you can see, that's affecting this bone here. This, of course, is your uh, tibia in the lower limb. This on the side here is the fibula. What's our differential diagnosis? It could be acute suppurative arthritis, rheumatic fever, so you should examine the synovial fluid, cellulitis, so the absence of soft tissue swelling on the, on the radiographs. How do we manage? So the management pretty much varies. So you may perform open drainage of an abscess or sequestrectomy or, or even an amputation. The most effective is actually performing extensive deprivement of all the necrotic tissue and granulation tissue along with reconstruction or reconstruction of the bone and soft tissue defects and cover them on antibiotics usually given for about 12 weeks. Then we should also offer some adjuvant therapy. So this is temporal placement of this uh, polymethyl methacrylate beads in the wound for a depot of administration of antibiotics. 
Complications include soft tissue abscesses, septic arthritis due to extension of adjacent joints, metastatic infections to other areas, pathological fractures, and if significant, can actually involve the spine and cause paraplegia. Coming back to our warm-up question, in acute osteomyelitis, there is often a history of bone trauma, so that is true. Long tubular bones are common sight, that is true. Bone drilling is preferred to saucerization. We don't want to really like remove large chunks of the bone, so that is true. So we do drill into the bone. And saucerization is preferable to bone drilling, which is false. I really hope you have enjoyed this video on osteomyelitis. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Until next time, au revoir. Thank you.